Uh, it's been great to see the presentation so far, and I'm glad to give you a little, um, do this one-on-one talk specifically on our uh, techno-economic analysis work um, to inform research at CABI. So just to start off, um, my research group, there, our intent uh, is to collaborate across CABI with researchers in feedstock, conversion, and sustainability to help inform decision-making. So when there's an idea for uh, a crop enhancement or a different crop, uh, if there's an idea for a uh, particular uh, bioproduct or uh, a candidate process or microorganism uh, or different policy, we'd like to help inform uh, the analysis of those alternatives so we can spend our time as effectively as possible. Um, and so where we start, I just want to um, first begin with a little bit of terminology and, and language, the way we think about these problems. Um, our goal is to track progress toward or away from sustainability, but ideally point us toward more sustainable systems. And so if we have some baseline where we are today um, with a feedstock uh, product or process, and we have some broad goals, so they might be things like we want financially viable, environmentally sustainable biofuels, and that's awesome, right? But we want to track progress in that direction. So to be able to do that, uh, we use indicators. So indicators are quantitative measures that we can look at to understand are we making progress toward our goal. And so in our case, a lot of times that's like dollars per gallon or kilogram CO2 equivalents per gallon, where kilogram CO2 equivalents is our measure of, of global warming potential and contributing to climate change. Uh, so once we have these indicators and we have our goals, we can then set targets. And so those will be specific indicator values with specific timelines. And so we might say we are targeting less than $2 a gallon by 2025 or something. We can set numbers for the indicators and uh, timetables. We can also set them for global warming potential. Um, and so, and the government, DOE does this a lot, so, so they can set the targets a lot of the time. Um, but as we track these indicators, um, in particular, we also look at trends. So we wanna understand how those indicators are changing over time. So how are, are we progressing toward our targets and toward our goals? And so we look at uh, improvements in costs and environmental impacts. And then lastly, we think about the driving forces. So what factors are governing these trends? So what is driving us uh, towards sustainability or away from sustainability or undermining our efforts towards sustainability? And so those are the things we try and track when we look at a candidate product process feedstock. So to give you an example, um, this is a, a lactic acid biorefinery, and I don't want you to focus on any of the boxes. Um, I just wanna walk through kind of the process we use to think about how to evaluate. Um, in this case, the example will be lactic acid production from lignocellulosic biomass. Um, and so one of the first things we do is we sit down and we work with folks in conversions and we think through uh, what would all the unit operations have to be. So at, if I were to build a biorefinery today, what are all the different things I would have to buy and connect um, to try and to actually operate and produce our, our final product, in this case, lactic acid for market. And the way we do this is we do this in Biosteam, which you've, you've heard a bunch about at the uh, uh, retreat. And so we've uh, developed this open source software that anyone can use. And what it actually looks like, it's in Python. And so when we sit down to code a biorefinery, we're actually typing you know, just letters and numbers that uh, look like they make no sense, but essentially we're just defining individual units. So all of these boxes, we're saying, hey, there's gonna be this reactor here. Here's what's coming into it. Here's the name of the stream going out of it. Um, and then we're gonna use the software to calculate what happens uh, in the reactor and how those st the streams leaving the reactor might be, uh, how compounds might be divided across those streams. And so all of this is available and, and we have documentation to help people walk through this process and learn the software. But the intent is to enable others to, with open source software, design these processes and simulate their performance. And so once we do that, once we identify all the units that are gonna be in the uh, biorefinery, um, all the different technologies, um, we then cost all of them. So we estimate the costs, uh, as well as their environmental impacts, their energy consumption and so on. But um, in particular, we're gonna use an example of like a storage tank. And so when we go to cost a storage tank, there are existing relationships that we can leverage. And so the graph I'm showing you now is just uh, the volume of the tank is on the X axis, uh, the storage tank, the purchase cost of the tank is on the Y axis and millions. 
And depending on the, our needs for the tank, and that'll be the compounds that it's storing, the pressure it's under, uh, any other, if it's corrosive, things like that, we have cost expressions that we can use um, to estimate the cost as a function of that unit size. And we have the same things for every unit across the plant, centrifuges and pumps and distillation columns and so on. So we estimate costs and we have these continuous expressions that let us do that as uh, depending on size. So then when we uh, go, we can we, we go on and we ultimately get a minimum product selling price or a minimum fuel selling price. And what a minimum product selling price is for like lactic acid is the lowest price at which we can sell the lactic acid we make such that everyone still makes enough profit. Um, and so we buy the feedstock and the farmers make a profit. It's processed. Um, we, the biorefinery makes a profit, they sell it to the market. And in this example, we have this baseline performance, that's this diamond. So with a set of assumptions we made, that's the minimum product selling price. And it's below the market range. So it's below what lactic acid sells for. So that's a good thing. That sounds really good. Um, and so with this TEA, technical economic analysis, we can also break down, well, what's, what are the driving forces? So what's causing those costs? And we can see how oh, there's a, the boiler is expensive and separations are expensive and so on. Um, and we can do a breakdown. And, but ultimately, as we think about like these costs, um, we made assumptions about lots every unit, but in particular like fermentation. Um, and so here we have yield of the lactic acid by the microorganisms producing it and titer. Uh, that, that's the concentration that the microorganisms can handle. And so this is how much lactic acid they produce from the sugar they're consuming and uh, the maximum concentration of lactic acid they can handle. And we made a set of assumptions based on what's been observed in the lab. Um, and so really we, we, that set of assumptions led us to this baseline cost value. So then we revisit, we think about this. Okay, well, we made a whole bunch of assumptions in this process. So we break it down into three categories. One are decision variables. So those are independent parameters that designers and operators can control. And that might be which feedstock we choose, which unit operations we use, operating pressures, and so on. It's something, a dials I can turn as, a, as an engineer. We also have technology parameters. So those are any values or ranges that are intrinsically defined by like the choices I've already made. So like the microorganisms, they have a titer they can handle, a yield that they uh, that will observe, a rate, of, a rate or productivity, and so on. Um, so product yield, maximum titer, and so on. And then we have contextual parameters. So these are any non-technological factors that are gonna influence design performance. And so those, that can be the facility location, any policy incentives, feedstock price, all sorts of things. And so we break it down into those categories and we wanna explore these further. And so we have our decision variables, technology parameters, contextual parameters. And what we do is we develop design algorithms and that's what's in BioSteam, but to automate the detailed design process. So if you pick a set of decision variables, we make a set of assumptions about technology parameters and contextual parameters, we get a detailed design. We automate the simulation. Those are uh, process algorithms. And then we automate technical economic analysis. We automate the life cycle assessment. And we get to these indicators like dollars per kilogram, dollars per gallon, and so on. And we run this set, uh, this, this, these models many thousands of times so we can understand uncertainty and we can understand the sensitivity of our results to specific assumptions. And what that lets us do is where we started, where we had this baseline value and this baseline set of assumptions, but well, we no longer have to make one set of assumptions. So now we can capture uncertainty. And so we can say, oh, actually in MPSP, we think it's somewhere between here and here. Uh, and so we think there's a good chance it's still below market. That's good, but there's a little more risk. And instead of one set of tighter and yield assumptions, we can actually look at the entire oops, entire space, entire opportunity space. And so we can look at what are the implications for gains in yield or gains in titer uh, for, for costs in this case. We can also look at it for environmental impacts and fossil energy consumption. Um, and so these are the same axes, yield on the X, titer on the Y, but we're showing the implications for global warming potential or fossil energy consumption if they do neutral fermentation or if they can develop an acid tolerant strain. Um, and we can look at the implications of those improvements. And then also we try and connect it back to feedstocks. And so if there are key assumptions we made about a feedstock, like ultimately like how much carbohydrate we're getting out of the feedstock um, that we're purchasing, uh, then 
uh, we can also look at the implications for MPSP, the minimum product selling price. So, and we can look at what we're willing to pay for the feedstock. So this is, in all cases, we're just trying to close the loop and inform uh, developments and conversions, developments and feedstocks. And with that, I'll end. So thanks very much.